The world's climate is changing. The sea level is rising. The ocean is warming. More heat to fuel the hurricanes that put us in harm's way. The hurricane is the greatest storm on Earth, and it's capable of doing tremendous damage and causing large loss of life. Is it possible that losses inflicted by the weather of the future may be even greater than those of today? The changes that we're having on the planet as a whole could be affecting the frequency, the severity uh, of these hurricanes. And that, I think that's something to, to be uh, extremely concerned about in the future. Prepare for our weather fate. Science searches the past for clues to the long-term trends in storm events. So by studying the past, we hope that it can help us better understand the present and to better predict the future. With the planet's evolving weather, how well prepared are we to survive the hurricanes of the 22nd century? Over the ocean, a new storm gathers strength, churning towards land. In what weather world would such systems move 100 years from now? Predictions of future climate have won climatologist Jean Pascal van Eberzel a Nobel Prize for science. Well, climate is going to change in the next 100 years, mostly through the uh, effect of human activities and greenhouse gases. And the main change is an average warming of the uh, temperature at the uh, surface of the planet. And there'll be changes in the uh, Atlantic storm activity. Just how those storms do change concerns scientists and forecasters of the Hurricane Research Community in Miami, Florida. There is still significant debate about how hurricanes may change um, as climate changes. There are modelers who are running 100-year scenarios that clearly show that the potential energy available for hurricanes will become greater. Most of the uh, these climate models are saying that we'll have fewer numbers of storms and hurricanes uh, as the climate warms. Uh, but then people also say that hurricanes are becoming stronger. The strength of the landfall of Hurricane Sandy made it the second most expensive hurricane of all time. During the night of October 28, 2012, it would change the lives of thousands. This is part of the Brick Township's uh, three and a half miles of the Barrier Island. And this is the aftermath of uh, Superstorm or Hurricane Sandy. That house that you see behind us here was actually up, uh, up by the beach, and, uh, and that came down. So uh, there's a, a, a truck underneath this house, uh, obviously the forklifts that you see. And just the force of the water uh, is really unimaginable, because you, when you look around and you see the devastation, you, never before would I, I've lived here all my life, would I believe that I'd see something like this. Despite its great size, this was a modest Category 1 storm, a deadly storm. But was it the superstorm of the future? We were here for Irene last year, and the water came up to the edge of the boardwalk, never went any further, and it went, really didn't do any damage. There's been people that have been down here a lot longer than myself. They said they, in all their years, 50 years, have never seen anything like this, and you can see what it did. It, 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 it's very... It, it had to be something, again, that no one could have ever expected to do this kind of damage. If the storm only had relatively weak winds, why was it so destructive? Sandy was producing uh, Category 1 hurricane force winds, but it was such a large storm. Its area of tropical storm force winds extended from the Carolinas up through much of New England. When we're talking about storm size and storm surge, it's very important Think about how the storm is pushing this water on shore. 
if you take your hand across a swimming pool and push just a little bit of water, it doesn't move very much. But if you take your entire arm across the top of that swimming pool, you'll push a large amount of water. And that's what we're looking at with storm sides. So it is not simply how often future storms would strike, but how damaging they will be in terms of size and power. Satellites encircling the planet collect the best data for computer models of future hurricane trends. Do we have more uh, tropical storms and hurricanes uh, in the historical database now than we did years ago? Absolutely, yes. And the reason for that, in my opinion, the primary reason of that is improvements in observations. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, before we had satellites, how did we even know we had a hurricane out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Satellite measurements were not available before with a good quality, and uh, therefore we only have a relatively short uh, record to talk about the, uh, the trends uh, in uh, hurricane activity. Official weather records only go back about 160 years. To extend our data set of when and where hurricanes have hit, we need to look deeper into the past. Yeah, that's about it. The last 160 years is too short for us to understand the frequencies of very intense but very rare hurricanes. And that is why we uh, try to extend that record, that period of observation from 160 years to two or 3,000 years so that we can have a longer period of time during which uh, more hurricanes like Katrina uh, did happen. But the past does not give up its secrets easily. And so part of the objectives of our work here uh, is to try to uh, find uh, evidence of ancient hurricanes and try to reconstruct uh, their frequencies during the last hundreds or thousands of years. The team are looking for traces of sand layers in the muddy swamp deposits, telltale signs of a powerful hurricane in the past. The soil itself serving as a natural archive of thousands of years of weather events. Well, when we open our core, we expect that the storm surge deposit uh, will have a different character visually because the mineral and chemical composition may be different. Uh, and also the storm surge deposit uh, may be of a different texture. Now you see this uh, root here that's uh, lying horizontally. It could have been washed in by, uh, by water, but uh, just looking at the color, you see it's very different. This is most likely uh, the Hurricane Isaac deposit, and it may go from here uh, down to about uh, here. But when we come down to here, then we can see the silt and clay laminations, you know, beautiful layers of, you know, darker bands and lighter bands. This material uh, might be several thousand years old. By analyzing many cores sampled across an area, they'll be able to find out how often big storms have occurred. We found that the most intense hurricanes, like uh, category four and five uh, hurricanes, they have a typical rate of hitting the same site maybe once every 300 years or so. The study of cycles of hurricane activity over time is helping geologists and climatologists to form a view of future climate trends. Assembling all that information uh, gives a, a relatively complete picture of how climate has evolved in the past. And that's very useful to validate uh, the climate models uh, in order to, um, to have confidence in them when they are used to look at the future. Complex computer models lead them to believe that hurricanes may actually become less frequent, but that it is not the full picture. In a warmer climate, hurricanes might become more intense even though they would become 
less frequent. Which means that although there will be fewer storms overall, more of them will be the most damaging of major hurricanes. A hurricane is still a rare event, and our memories are very short. I've seen a lot of hurricanes even here in Miami. Uh, we went through a Category 5 hurricane, Hurricane Andrew, in 1992. But with time, people forget what these hurricanes can do. Societies affected by hurricanes would do well to recall such major storms because the past can help us prepare for future impacts. One country that has not forgotten the deadly effects of hurricanes is Cuba. Jose Rubiera, head of the Meteorological Service, remembers a turning point in his country's storm planning. Hurricane Flora was the first hurricane hitting Cuba after the revolution. It was in 1963. It was the second greatest natural catastrophe in Cuban history. Fidel Castro was very, very affected by the amount of casualties that uh, Cuba had uh, in this hurricane. It was a terrible hurricane. As Cuba counted the cost, Castro's response was to create a new institute of meteorology with special focus on hurricane forecasting. Cuban society is structured in such a way that the lessons of hurricane flora are adhered to. Evacuation orders are obeyed, construction tightly regulated, and forecasting driven by a single clear voice. Rubiera's weather bulletins are the focal point for a state-driven hurricane action plan that is totally supported by the populace. Our country, Cuba, has a long-standing understanding of hurricanes, mainly due to Dr. Rubiera's efforts. When the hurricane is close to making landfall, people are already evacuated. Cuba is one of the safest places to be when a hurricane event makes landfall. The Cuban authorities are very concerned about what will happen to the people. The aim is state-governed protection, whatever the future brings. In the last 17 years, we have seen nine hurricanes stronger than flora, and the loss of life have been minimum. But the storm-scarred buildings of ancient Havana serve as a constant reminder that direct impacts from future hurricanes have the potential to be catastrophic. Cubans are acutely aware that the worst may yet be to come. With global temperatures continuing to rise at 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, conditions are likely to foster the formation of increasingly severe storms. But even without the effects of climate change, the probability is that we will witness an Atlantic landfall from a storm of Sandy's great size and with the power of an Andrew or Flora. Such storms may become a more common occurrence with up to a 50% increase in major category storms a possibility. The heavily developed coast of the eastern United States is at risk, nowhere more so than the thin strip of coastal barrier islands. Barrier islands fringe thousands of miles of the east coast, bearing the brunt of any storm weather and sheltering the mainland. Born and raised on Florida's east coast, Tim Palmer is concerned by the changes he's seen in the local islands. There's always been development on the barrier islands, but it seems like there's more and more and more development. Places that were all sea grapes and mangroves and casarinas 
now a lot of times are host to uh, condominiums and parking lots. You know, it's one thing to build on the river side of the barrier island because that's going to be protected by the rest of the land. But when you start putting these high-rise condominiums on the ocean side, not only are you building them in a place where they could possibly be endangered someday, but also you're taking away that vegetation which gives the barrier island its fabric that holds it together. If you get a minimal hurricane, even that's enough a lot of times to punch through places in the barrier island. It's much more likely to do it once the sea oats and the sea grapes and the mangroves have been removed. It's a problem that has been studied by a U.S. geological survey team led by Abby Salinger. In a completely natural situation, the barrier islands uh, would, would migrate landward. Uh, and they would have room to migrate land. But, ar but around, the, uh, around the country, we have built uh, so much infrastructure in place, either on the barrier islands or just immediately on the mainland, uh, on the mainland side of the barrier islands, that, that in a lot of places, there's no room for the island to, to evolve further. Uh, you know, particularly places like Miami Beach or Ocean City or Virginia Beach with huge buildings, uh, you have fixed the location in, in place, but yet the natural system wants to move landward. And humans now come in and try to maintain the islands where they are. And, and we have seen over and over that that, that can be uh, a losing game. In 2011, Hurricane Irene crossed the Pamlico Sound in North Carolina as a large Category 1 storm. It attacked the Outer Bank Islands near Cape Hatteras, driving a storm surge of about six feet across the Sound. It breached the barrier islands repeatedly, the storm smashing bridges, shattering roads, and destroying houses along a 250-mile stretch of coast. Abby's team have surveyed the entire seaboard of the eastern United States using laser imagery called LIDAR, precisely mapping the topography to identify future weak spots in coastal defenses. This is airborne LIDAR data, uh, the first that uh, we received back from our partners at NOAA. That uh, shows very clearly uh, the houses along the beach and how close some of the uh, cottages here are to the ocean. The islands themselves are extremely vulnerable to damage, and Tim believes construction only serves to increase that risk. Every time we've had it break through, it always seems to be fairly near where we've changed things. Either we've dug a, a canal or we've built buildings. Uh, these barrier islands are pretty much made to, to shift around. They get bigger, they get smaller. The sand piles up, the sand washes away. When we put a building on it, that really, really kind of disrupts the, you know, the natural cycle. But desire to build on the ocean's doorstep is increasing. With sea levels rising, that puts more people at greater risk. The occurrence of major category storms is predicted to be more frequent, and with beach sand playing a vital role in protecting coasts, the scale of ongoing beach erosion concerns Alfredo Toruella. When a storm impacts a beach, the beach sheds its sand, creating a sandbar which causes the waves to break offshore, taking the pressure off the beach. So it's sort of a self-defense mechanism, but that's a short-term phenomena which after a storm passes, the normal waves then restore the beach to its previous condition. So that, that assumes a cycle. But that natural cycle is already broken by coastal development. To compensate, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers oversees a vast program of beach replenishment at the cost of many millions of dollars each year. In Florida, one of the world's largest dredging ships pumps marine sand ashore, 
in an operation overseen by program manager Jackie Kaiser. In Florida, the, the sand generally flows from north to south. And as development has taken place, we've hardened our shoreline. We've reduced the width of beaches. We've taken away dunes so folks can have an ocean view, which all uh, intercept sand that would otherwise be moving down the coast. Interrupting that natural southward flow of sand with human structures creates turbulence that results in sand being lost to the ocean. As the shoreline recedes, we've uh, moved forward with beach renourishment to try to maintain a, a shoreline and maintain a, a good width of berm to act as a protective barrier for hurricanes or major storm events. The Army Corps budgets millions of dollars a year both to rebuild beaches and dredge clear storm damage. When the sand washes away, what the answer has been over the last few decades is to just pump sand from you know, the bottom offshore and then just pile it up onto the beach. Uh, I've seen this go on now for probably 25 years, and it seems as fast as they put it onto the beach, it goes right back off again. Uh, the sad thing is that not only does all the, all the work and all the money towards building up the beach seem to be wasted, but also the sand piles up on the natural reefs that we have out here just off of the beach. When a hurricane erodes a beach, many people sometimes feel like, well, that was a waste of money. We, we spent all that money to get our beach, and now it's gone. But that's exactly what we designed the beach to do, to sacrifice itself for the upland structures and for human health and safety and our infrastructure. The immense task of replacing the natural cycle with engineering efforts will increase as sea levels rise. If we stop dredging for beach renourishment in Florida, there would be a devastating effect to the economy. Tourism alone is a $60 billion industry or income producer for the state of Florida, and it's a great federal tax producer as well. The hotels, the streets, the schools, the hospitals, the roads uh, would basically be abandoned at some point due to storm damages. In economic terms, we need to keep pumping sand. But the question is whether the sand alone can adequately defend against the worsening storms of the future. With the danger from landfalling hurricanes increasing, the growing coastal populations need ever more protection to the built infrastructure. Well, protective action uh, is, uh, can be seen in, in two categories. One is adaptation, is, is kind of uh, weatherproofing, having better uh, building codes so that when intense wind or rain comes, those uh, infrastructures can resist better. In 1992, Cat 5 Hurricane Andrew smashed into Florida, south of Miami an event that was to change the standards of an entire industry. Today, hurricane safety building codes are enforced by inspectors like Eugenio Santiago. I think Andrew taught us a very, very valuable lesson. We need to make sure that things are built the right way, both from the design point of view and from the construction point of view. And just what dangers are those changed regulations seeking to prevent? Well, the worst damage is what we call the envelope. Uh, the envelope is what protects the perimeter of the building. It's either walls or glass. And if one of those two fails, then wind gets inside and just destroys the building. You blow on a balloon, and you blow in long enough, the balloon explodes. That's what happens to a house. This damage was inflicted by a Category 1 storm. We are threatened by far worse. Hurricane Andrew uh, will be remembered for an extremely intense Category 5 hurricane, uh, but it was not the big one. Andrew was a small hurricane, extremely small. If we had a more typical sized hurricane or even a large hurricane like uh, Sandy or Katrina and the strength of Andrew, the damage uh, would have been much, much worse. Civil engineers like Forest Masters plan for precisely that scenario. 
we're trying to reduce the loss of life and property during extreme wind events. And in order to do that, we have to have a very clear picture of the wind and wind-driven rain environment. The work we're doing is filling in a critical gap. We're taking measurements in the building stock, you know, amongst the buildings, in hurricanes. This is where the damage happens. Those field observations are taken to the laboratory to be tested in safety. But first, they have to recreate the hurricane. So we built a machine to replicate hurricane conditions in a controlled setting. We can generate up to 230 mile per hour winds. And this creates significant pressures on the roof coverings. And in turn, that allows us to find exactly when the failure threshold is expected to occur. Let's bring it up. <laughs> where we can carefully control the wind speed to replicate what happens on an actual roof. The end game is to design roofing materials that can withstand the wind speed of the most severe hurricanes. thousand houses were destroyed by Hurricane Andrew in less than 24 hours. In the most severe winds, even vertical structures are at risk. To test designs, the team built the dynamic pressure loading actuator, which creates hurricane load conditions on the side of buildings. Daniel, put the second the camera in the second panel down from the top. OK, just make sure the traceable spheres are in the line of sight. Okay. Yeah, it looks good. All right. OK. This particular system is designed to produce an extreme amount of pressure. Think about the types of loads that would occur on the top of a skyscraper in a Category 5 storm or an EF4 tornado on a low-rise building. And that would give you a sense of the magnitude of the power. Okay. All set. All right, Scott, go ahead and start the engine so we can begin the test. OK. Ultimately, we're trying to create an environment where manufacturers can push boundaries. They can try new things. They can innovate and understand that what they're seeing is actually what will happen in a real hurricane event. And that hopefully will give them the confidence they need to push forward to keep advancing their technologies. Civil engineers are improving modern designs with the aim of surviving Category 5 wind speeds of 150 miles per hour or more. But a major storm landfall brings far more than just wind. It's a problem that focuses the attention of physical oceanographers at the University of Miami in Florida. A major Category 5 storm may have waves well over 30 feet high. And it's not just the wave size that matters, because their height can be doubled by the storm's tidal surge. Here, they can study in safety the potential impact of waves on man-made structures using models. With rising sea levels, the damage from future storms will be even greater. Sea level rise is um, a parameter that is now well measured uh, through all the world. And it is now very clear from those measurements that sea level has increased on average by almost 20 centimeters since 
uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And it's only the beginning because the uh, projections for uh, the uh, end of this century show a possible increase in sea level that's between 30 centimeter, one foot, and uh, one meter, more than three feet. Potentially a big changes for millions of people living close to our coast. Whatever form the hurricanes of the future do take, there is no doubt their reach will stretch ever further inland. The changing pressures and extreme winds of a major hurricane may cause a tidal storm surge 20 feet high. As rising sea levels force such surges to new heights, coastal erosion is set to increase. Beach erosion is driven by high energy events, really. And uh, because Puerto Rico is in the, in the smack dab in the middle of the path of hurricanes, uh, every summer, or every hurricane season, rather, uh, we are subject to serious erosional events. So uh, absolutely, hurricanes play a big role in beach erosion in Puerto Rico. And that role is likely to grow if major hurricanes become more common in the future. But San Juan has an unlikely defense. The reefs off San Juan are actually surprisingly healthy in, in certain pockets. Of course, there are areas that, that are quite devastated, but it's amazing to be snorkeling uh, and, and looking at, at some beautiful corals and, and stick your head out of water and see a, a metropolitan city just one mile away. Alfredo has known for years that reefs absorb wave energy, but he didn't know by how much. In 2011, he had a chance to find out. Tropical Storm Irene is just east of Puerto Rico, and uh, we're hoping that it intensifies to a hurricane uh, any time now. Well, the idea is to record uh, the currents and waves during the storm, something which has uh, never actually been done uh, here in Puerto Rico. But ultimately, uh, we want to see what effect uh, the waves have uh, on the erosion of the beach uh, as they are transformed by the effect of the reefs. Because there's a, a protective reef offshore in front of the city of San Juan. And we want to see how they interact, how the reefs interact with the waves and the currents, and what effect that has on the erosion of the beaches during a storm. With the storm a mere 18 hours away, there's no time to waste. <laughs> Essentially, the instrument is a, about a three-foot cylinder, and we affix it to a base that's custom-made, and we go diving and go to the bottom of the ocean and secure it to the, to the bottom of the ocean. We place these instruments outside of the fringing reef and inside of the fringing reef so that we could have a record of the waves and the currents associated with the storm, with Hurricane Irene. Later, we took that information and used it to calibrate a model of the entire area. And using the model, we could examine the wave patterns and the current patterns that the hurricane generated. Irene strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane over Puerto Rico, with powerful waves striking the north coast. The 30-foot waves generated by Hurricane Irene as it passed San Juan lost over 90% of their energy on the offshore reefs. Only 10% reached the beaches of the city. If those reefs weren't there, the impact on the shore, the energy arriving on the shore would be 10 times as great. If you want to understand the forces involved, picture this. One cubic yard of water is approximately one ton, similar to the weight of a small car. Well, 
Imagine a wave containing dozens and dozens of cubic yards of water hurling at you about 20 miles an hour. The forces are certainly significant. Take that up to the next level. A hurricane generates waves in excess of 30, 40, 50 feet. We're talking literally thousands of the equivalent of small cars being hurled at you at 20 miles an hour. The impact is truly devastating. And now we have one more uh, reason why we need to preserve these reefs. And, and that reason is that without the reefs, they would not block the, the wave energy during storms, and the city of San Juan would not exist as it does today. Many cities around the Caribbean Sea were built using the protection of offshore reefs. But today, those reefs are in serious decline. The loss of protective coral reefs is a vital issue in low-lying South Florida, where the Moat Marine Tropical Laboratories research into solutions, led by David Vaughn. The Florida Keys are a place where our elevations here are only a few meters. So without our barrier to wave action and storms such as a coral reef, uh, it's critical here in the Florida Keys. We've lost a decent amount of our outer reef corals. Those were the first barrier uh, to things like storm surges and wave actions. We have lost 25% of the world's corals in just the past 20 to 40 years because we've lost some of those bigger outer reef corals like the Elkhorn, those majestic corals that were out in the forefront. But 98% of those are gone. And so now our coral reefs are much more susceptible to wave action. In its natural state, coral is less and less capable of protecting shorelines from hurricanes. Its decline is largely a result of human activities, such as overfishing, industry, and pollution. But can the clock be turned back? In any other species, they do what's called restoration. If a forest burns down, we know how to grow a new tree and replant a forest. We've been trying over the past 10 years to see if corals can be restored and replanted. And the good news is it's working not only working, it's working even better than I originally thought. One team of biologists from Moat Marine is aiming to restore the reefs of the Caribbean. Staghorn coral has always been uh, adapted to deal with um, weather events like hurricanes. Uh, a big part of its, its natural process for reproduction is that it can break into smaller pieces during storms and, and events like that. And each of those pieces can anchor themselves to the reef and reestablish as a whole new colony. But those staghorn colonies have all but disappeared. It's one of the most important corals here in the Florida Keys as far as um, building the reefs. Um, and it's also one of the ones that's in the greatest decline in the last uh, few decades. And it has the greatest potential, though, for restoration because it's one of the faster growing species of corals here in the Keys. Um, but a bigger part of this project is we work with partners um, throughout all of South Florida and the rest of the Caribbean so that we have these, these uh, coral nurseries spread out uh, throughout the Caribbean, all sort of following the same procedures and with the same intent. Um, but that way, no one nursery is, if we were to be impacted by a storm or hurricane here in the other Keys, uh, we could just work with our other partners in other regions and the project would continue to move forward. Flourishing in the shallows is a farm of living rock. Healthy, live, hard coral has a thin outer skin of living tissue that manufactures an inner limestone skeleton, which gives strength and form. Uh, because we live in an area that's uh, prone to a lot of hurricane impacts, um, We've had to take that into account with the way that we, we grow our corals. We grow it several different methods, anchored to the bottom. Uh, some of them are hanging in, in uh, mid-water structures that can move with the waves and the tides.
these corals, they grow quickly, and if we do it in a controlled environment where we can uh, take care of these smaller pieces um, and, and grow them up to a size where they're strong enough to deal with some of these other stressors out on the reef, and we put them out in the reef in enough numbers and with enough diversity, um, we're actually gonna make these, these small compact populations that will um, cross fertilize each other and repopulate the entire reef tract. But the ocean itself is changing, making the task ever more difficult. We have burned a little more than 500 billion tons of carbon since the beginning of the industrial period. Around 150 billion tons of that carbon have been absorbed by the oceans, therefore contributing to the acidification of the oceans, which is also a problem. Acids dissolve calcium carbonate, which forms coral skeletons. It is whether an acidifying ocean affects living coral that is the subject of research here in Miami for scientist Ian Enix. Corals are very complex structures. They have all sorts of uh, surface indentations, multiple branches, and because of that, um, we actually use 3D scanning. Here I have a sample of the endangered uh, staghorn coral. Uh, we have grown these corals in a laboratory that we have that very precisely mimics uh, conditions that are predicted for the end of the century. So we can monitor living corals as it changes in different ocean acidification conditions. By using scanning techniques to look inside the coral skeletons, they have confirmed that it is becoming weaker and less capable of growth. So we know that ocean acidification affects reefs in really two different ways. One, the, the corals actually slow down. And two, the natural organisms that erode the reef, that actually increases as well. So we have a really difficult situation of slowing growth and increasing erosion. And clearly this is very difficult to maintain a healthy reef ecosystem. If the ocean continues to acidify and warm, coral reefs will find it ever harder to grow in a sustainable fashion. The team at Moat Marine are trying to preempt the changes. We're definitely trying to predict what the reefs will be like, whether we like it or not. Uh, I guess we are building a reef of tomorrow. Identifying what exactly the coral of those futuristic reefs will be is the focus of new research. The experiment we have going on is called our ocean acidification system in which we can vary the pH from what it was a few years ago to what it is today to what it may be 20 or 50 years from now. And in the offshore farm, there are plans for the future as well. Our staghorn project uh, by design was trying to get as many genetic variations of the same species out there. And so we're watching all of these different coral genetic strains. Some seem to be growing better, and we'll see in the future with different ocean conditions which ones are going to be winners. If global warming goes unchecked, the ocean will continue to become more hostile to coral growth. So 50 to 100 years from now, we may have to restore corals a couple of times before there's no longer a threat by global warming high temperatures and ocean acidification. But I'd like to see the potential of in 10 years to almost completely restore the reefs the way they used to be. Despite these efforts with climate changing, coral faces an uncertain future. Just like the barrier islands, the natural defenses our forebears built their cities behind are becoming ever less secure. Events of November 2013 set a terrible precedent. When this monster storm made landfall, it completely destroyed the city of Tacloban in the Philippines. 45-foot waves and 200-mile-per-hour winds left at least 6,000 dead. It was Cat 5 Super Typhoon Haiyan.
Scientists predict such superstorms will become more common worldwide. How seriously should we take these predictions? We can't make a reliable intensity forecast out to five days, so I'm not sure how accurate that it's going to be out, you know, 100 years. Validating a climate model based on the data we have of the Earth's historical past is difficult. We have very little relevant data available with which to make a comparison with our ongoing simulations. What is clear is that the sea level increase will render the effects of hurricanes and tropical storms in general stronger and more damaging. No matter how many hurricanes we have in the future, if there are more hurricanes or fewer hurricanes or the same number of hurricanes, whatever hurricanes we have will likely call, cause more damage because of the gradual sea level rise. And it's not a simple linear function. It's not like sea level went up a foot, therefore the tidal surge will be a foot higher. It's much more complicated than that. It could be many miles further inland. Despite the increasing danger, the desire to build right on the ocean's threshold is continuing unabated. Wilderness, with its remaining natural defenses, ever more rare. If you look at development, you know, we continue to develop these coastal areas, these very vulnerable coastal areas. And most local politicians see that as a good thing. You know, if you increase the uh, population, uh, nicer homes, uh, which we usually have on the coast, uh, that increases the tax base. But development in search of economic benefit risks putting society in harm's way, from which science alone may not be able to protect us. The problem is, is much wider than just a scientific problem. It's uh, also a technical problem, an economic problem, a human problem, a moral problem. To solve these problems collectively, perhaps our crowded society of today should take note of the wisdom of citizens in Louisiana over 150 years ago. In central Louisiana, there's a, a, an island called Ile de Nier. It's the last island, last barrier island to the west along the, the coast of Louisiana. Back in the 1850s, uh, it was developed as a resort. One year in 1856, a hurricane came along, and, and it killed half of the people there. Every house, every structure of the island was laid flat. And what happened was, they decided not to rebuild. Within the United States, this is very unusual. Uh, after a major storm comes through, our first response is to go in and rebuild along the coastline, and, and commonly to rebuild bigger, more elaborately, very close to the beach. Rather than rebuilding more and more grandly after each disaster, imagining that everything can be just the way it was, shouldn't we consider changing our habits? Because if we only try to adjust to that warming climate, and if we do not work in the area of prevention uh, by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it will not be possible anymore to adjust for the increased intensity of those damages. In an uncertain future, there are certainties. Natural habitats are weakening. Urban coastal developments are increasing. And sea levels are rising. As fast as we build, prepare, secure and maintain, trying to conserve and reshape the coastal strip, working ever harder to preserve our lifestyle, it seems the elemental Earth is changing faster still. Thank you.